Hello everyone, my name is Alexandra Buna and I'll be your guest lecturer today on the cerebellum. I wanted to thank you guys for having me and I hope you guys enjoy this lecture. So today we'll be talking about a five main topics on the cerebellum. First, its physical features, the functional regions, its cerebellar nuclei and the tracts associated with them, its blood supply, and what happens if it gets damaged. Now we're going to start off by looking at the physical features of the cerebellum. This is located at the back of the brain, behind the brain stem, and also called the little brain because it quite literally looks like a smaller version of our brain. It has three major lobes. We have the anterior lobe, posterior lobe, and floculonodular lobe. Now you'll notice this is very small, but has a very important function as we'll find out later on. In addition to these lobes, we have a few fissures we need to know. We have the primary fissure. This separates the anterior lobe from the posterior lobe. In addition, we have the posterolateral fissure. This separates the posterior lobe from the floculonodular lobe. Now we have a few additional structures listed here, but you do not need to know these for the exam. So the horizontal fissure, previventral fissure, and tonsil are not required for your exam. Just focus on what's highlighted and boxed here uh, because we'll be focusing on more clinical aspects and the others aren't as necessary. Now we're going to move on to the functional regions of the cerebellum. These are vertical portions that coordinate with their functions. You'll find that these will be color-coded for your convenience. You can also see here the primary fissure again, separating the anterior lobe from the posterior lobe, which we just went over. We're going to start off with the vermis. This is the central portion of the cerebellum. It's associated with postural adjustment. Now this makes sense because the core muscles around your vertebral column help you with posture. So it makes sense that the core portion of the cerebellum is also associated with posture. Lateral to that, we have the intermediate region. This is associated with limb adjustment. And just lateral to that, you have the lateral region, which is associated with motor movement, uh, well, mo motor memory and motor coordination. So everyone knows of the concept of muscle memory but it's not exactly memory of your muscles, it's actually your cerebellum is responsible for that. So when you play piano or guitar or something like that and your fingers just know where to go, they have that automatic positioning to play the songs, that's your cerebellum at work. It's not necessarily the muscles in your fingers remember where to go, but your cerebellum remembers those connections because the uh, responsibility of the lateral uh, region of your cerebellum is to form a memory of these motor sequences and basically relay them later on so that you can automatically do that uh, movement again. It's essentially like a program because the cortex tells you what you want to do and the cerebellum will relay that uh, motor sequence to carry out that function. And lastly, we have the floculonodular lobe. Now this is on the anterior view of the cerebellum. So normally you wouldn't be able to see it. So you would have to remove the cerebellum from the cortex and look on the inside. And uh, you will see this in the nook of the cerebellum, essentially. Now, uh, floculus actually means egg-shaped. So that explains why you have essentially two little eggs attached to the nodule in the center. Now, Dr. Sani likes to uh, equate this to flocculus means fluffy because they kind of look fluffy and that stuck with me. So whichever method works for you guys to remember this. And this is responsible for balance and head movements. Like I said earlier, it's a very important function because it gives uh, in addition to balance, it tells you where your head is in space and helps you with orientation. Uh, next, we have the deep nuclei of the cerebellum. Now, these will be associated with the functional regions we just previously saw, so they'll be color-coded accordingly uh, for your convenience, as per Dr. Sani. 
So first off, we're going to start with the vestigial nucleus. You'll see that's the most uh, medial of them in the center, right where the vermis would be. And that's because it's also responsible for postural adjustment, just like the vermis. So the, uh, those work together. Lateral to that, in yellow, you have the interposed nuclei. And just like the intermediate region, it's associated with limb adjustments. Now, there are two types of interposed nuclei, emboliform and globus. However, you do not need to know that for your exam. You just simply know it as interposed nuclei. Do not focus on the two specific names. Next, we have the dentate nucleus. This is associated with the lateral region, shown here in green. And once again, it's responsible for a movement coordination. Now, this last one is a little special. Uh, vestibular nuclei of the spinal cord. Notice it says spinal cord, not cerebellum. So technically, the vestibular nuclei is not a cerebellar nuclei. However, we still group them together because of its function of balance and head movements. So it does coordinate with the flocular nodular lobe, even though it's not located there. So make sure to make this distinction in your notes that it's located in the pons, of the, uh, but, uh, but not in the flocular nodular lobe. It's actually quite a large nucleus. Uh, we can't see it here, but it has a couple of subsections and has a little more function, but just know the ones that are listed here. This is just another slide, putting them side by side so you can associate them by color. Once again, vestigial nucleus is associated with the vermis, interposed nuclei with the intermediate region, dentate nucleus with the lateral region, and the uh, vestibular nuclei is associated with the flocular nodular lobe, even though it's not a true cerebellar nuclei. Now here's a little more in depth. The vestigial nucleus, as we said, is responsible for postural adjustment. And then if you guys remember your tracks from a few weeks ago, I would review that for this lecture because they're, go they're gonna come back this nucleus has inputs from the posterior spinal cerebellar tract. Uh, so these will go into the cerebellum and they function on the vestigial nucleus. Uh, whereas the interposed nuclei have inputs from the anterior spinal cerebellar tract, which do once again limb adjustments and function with the interposed nuclei. Uh, and then, once again, the dentate nucleus has inputs from the cortex and pontine nuclei, and vestibular nuclei has inputs from cranial nerve 8, because remember this is a vestibular cochlear nerve, so the vestibular side of this nerve will be responsible for helping with balance and uh, sense of orientation. But we'll, go, we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So another part of the cerebellum that we need to look at are the peduncles. Now these are connections from the spinal cord to the cerebellum. So these are essentially uh, the axons of the tracks uh, that are located here. So we have three pairs of the fire bundles that connect the cerebellum to the brainstem. We have superior, middle, and inferior cerebellar peduncles. So first off, we have the superior cerebellar peduncles, which contain the afferents from the anterior spinal cerebellar tract. They ascend in the brainstem, go past the cerebellum into the midbrain, and turn back around into the cerebellum via these superior cerebellar peduncles. And the outputs for these will be, uh, they, uh, they go to the red nucleus, the cortex and vestibular nuclei. Next, we have the middle cerebellar peduncles, which contain the afferents from contralateral cortex to uh, via the pontine nuclei. Once again, because it's contralateral, these are crossing fibers in the pons. So the pyramidal neurons, upper motor neurons, they travel down the pons to form the pyramids, have the contralaterals that synapse on pontine nuclei and those nuclei cross into the cerebellum so that your cerebellum knows what the intended output is. So next we have 
the inferior cerebellar peduncles, which have afferents from the posterior spinal cerebellar tracts that head up into the anterior lobe, and the outputs are the inferior olive. So just keep these in mind with the tracks. Again, review the tracks. It'll help you with this lecture more. To go back, this will hopefully help connect some dots uh, with, this, with that lecture. Another thing I wanted to quickly mention is one of the functions of the cerebellar is mainly to correct actions. It's very, it's inhibitory. So uh, let's say, so again, with the middle cerebellar peduncle, let's say your cortex is planning to do something and your cortex will tell your cerebellum what you're planning. And then the cerebellum can know based on the ascending tracks located here, if you're doing the action correctly or not. If you're not, it will uh, it will use its uh, motor sequences to correct your actions. I'll try to give a few more examples later on in the lecture regarding that. Now we're gonna look at it from a more molecular perspective, a more microscopic perspective. The cerebellum itself has three main layers. We have molecular layer, the Purkinje cell layer, which is very, very thin, and the granule layer below that, molecular being the most external and granule being the most internal. Now, the molecular layer contains the dendritic trees of these Purkinje cells, the, as you see here. What's very cool about these trees are, these dendritic trees are that they are two-dimensional, they are planar. So if you think about it like a hand, if you look at your hand straight forward, you see all five fingers, they fan out. But if you turn your hand, say 90 degrees, and you're looking at it from the side, it looks flat, right? So if you've seen this picture, it's the same thing with these Purkinje dendritic trees in the molecular layer. You can see here on the left how they fan out. But if you look at the different cross section on the right, they actually look like straight lines. And this is uh, functionally, functionally significant because if you think about it in terms of uh, surface area and space, you'll be able to stack more of these and make more motor connections. And in addition, because of the dendritic trees, they are, these Purkinje cells are able to sample a lot of inputs and, but only have one output. So they're able to correct stuff, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, and also just uh, as an FYI, they are called Purkinje cells, but they have no correlation or relation at all to Purkinje fibers. They were just discovered by the same guy, but they have no connection. So uh, next, on, in addition, in the molecular layer, we also have these parallel fibers. You can see these in the black. They come from the granule cells and travel upwards towards the molecular layer. And this parallel fiber ends up being sampled by the dendrites of these Purkinje cells. So this granule cell, which is with its fair, uh, with its parallel fiber, is the input to the cerebellum. So this tells the cerebellum what is going on, and the cerebellum knows how to uh, correct that based on the information it receives from the Purkinje cells. Next, you see this very thin Purkinje cell layer, which is where the cell body of these Purkinje cells are located. They actually line up quite nicely, and the Purkinje cells are the only output of the cerebellum. And as I mentioned before, they are inhibitory. So rather than telling your body what to do, the cerebellum is more so responsible of telling it what not to do. So a very simple a uh, basic example, let's say you're just walking straight and your right foot goes astray. It just starts going sideways for some reason. Your cerebellum is going to notice that and say stop and inhibit that action to make the leg go back uh, to walking straight. Again, this is a very basic example, but hopefully gives you the idea that your body is going to walk because it knows how to walk. But for whatever instance, if you start doing the wrong action, the cerebellum will realize that and correct your behavior and your muscles to do the correct action. So just realize that these are inhibitory. It's kind of the only thing your cerebellum really does. 
it samples everything that's going on and then will tell that one muscle or multiple muscles if that's the case to correct or stop that behavior if necessary. Now below that we have the granule layer. This contains the granule cell bodies and those axons will go up into the molecular layer which form those parallel fibers as we mentioned before. Uh, oh, and here it's color coded. I apologize. The molecular layer here, Purkinje cell layer, and the granule cell layer below that. In addition, we have mossy fibers. These are synapsing on the granule cells, and these mossy fibers come from the spinocerebellar tracts, as well as having fibers uh, from the pontine nuclei, and these relay cortical information. So through these, your cortex is able to tell your cerebellum what it's trying to do. And then the cerebellum will be like, okay, yes, you're doing this correctly, move on. Or no, your muscles are not performing it correctly, let me correct that. So yes, the spinal cerebellar tracts are what is responsible for carrying that cortical information and telling your cerebellum what it wants to do. Other inputs include these climbing fibers that you can see in blue, and these come from the inferior olive. Now this is very important because they coordinate the timing of your movements. So the sequence, the correct sequence of events that will need to occur is responsible. Uh, the inferior olive is responsible for this. It receives the afferent in information and coordinates the timing of your movements. So. To summarize, the cerebellar cortex has an internal chain of three neurons. You have the inputs that, you know, it's coming from the granule cells. You have the, in, uh, actually, let me correct that. The inputs are uh, your actions and whatnot. The interneurons are your granule cells. And your outputs are your Purkinje cells. Now, this is... Uh, an image that I took in my histology class and helped me with this so I figured it might be helps helps some of you guys now just to clarify you do not need to know any histology for your exam this is purely for an, uh, to be another resource for you guys to hopefully help you guys understand the layers a little better so you guys can see you have the molecular layer here on the outside of the cerebellum you know it's the outside because you can see the white space just to the left of it you can see the Purkinje cell bodies that I circled here, and like I specified, they just form a nice straight line. But again, it's a very small layer because it's only the Purkinje cell bodies. And then you can see the granule cell layer to the right of that. And it's called so not only because of the granule cells, but because under the microscope, especially with the H&E stain, it looks very granular in nature. So it's quite easy to tell the difference between these uh, three layers. So once again, this is just to help you guys. You don't need to know it for your test. But in case some of you guys are a little more visual and want to see what it actually looks like under the microscope, I wanted to provide you guys uh, with this resource. Now we're just going to review the nuclei that are associated with the tracks once again, just to really hit home on the outputs and inputs for these nuclei. Once again, review the tracks from a few weeks ago, and this is just going to uh, really uh, summarize it for you guys. So once again, we have the vestigial nucleus, which is what a deep cerebellar nuclei. It's responsible for postural uh, adjustment and associated with the vermis of the cerebellum. Now the outputs of this nuclei is the lateral vestibulospinal tract, uh, which is through the vestibular nuclei. Now these vestibular nuclei have efferents going down the vestibulospinal tract, and these help with core balance. So it makes sense. Now the inputs for the vestigial nucleus are again the vestibular nuclei and the posterior spinal cerebellar tracts, which is responsible for giving this information to the cerebellum regarding uh, your core balance. Next we have the interposed nuclei. Now again this is associated with the intermediate region of the cerebellum and responsible for limb adjustments. The output of this nuclei is the rubrospinal tract via the red nucleus. Now, if you remember, red nucleus is responsible for upper limb flexor movement. So it makes sense that this is 
incorporated in uh, with the interposed nuclei because it helps you balance your upper limbs. Afterwards, it goes down to your lower, uh, lower motor neurons via the rubrospinal tract. Now, the inputs to this uh, interposed nuclei is the inferior olive, as well as uh, limb movements via your anterior spinal cerebellar tract. Like I said earlier, like a lot of the inputs are your actual movements, and then your cerebellum will analyze this and correct it if needed to become the correct uh, movement. So again, the input for interposed nuclei, inferior olive, because it coordinates the timing of the limb movements, and anterior spinal cerebellar tract, uh, because it receives the information from your limbs. Now we have the dentate nucleus, which once again is associated with motor movements, motor coordination, motor memory, uh, the lateral portion of the cerebellum. The outputs are the lateral corticospinal tract, and the inputs can be from the cortex and the pontine nuclei, which is going to happen through the middle cerebellar peduncle, as we mentioned earlier. Lastly, we have the flocculonodular lobe. Now, once again, this is responsible for balance and head movement, is associated with the vestibular nuclei in the spinal cord. Now, the outputs are to the vestibular nuclei, so uh, helps you to, to do the head movements and balance, and helps form the vestibular spinal tracts that will help with your balance based on where your head is going. So, and then inputs to this system is the vestibular cochlear nerve, as we mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, the cranial nerve eight, because the vestibular side of that is associated with balance and helps you give your uh, a sense of orientation in space. So of course that is of course that's going to be an input for the flocculonodular lobe because this is responsible for balance and head movement. So it's no surprise that cranial nerve 8 is the input uh, for this. Now, here's a flow chart that Dr. Sani put together for you guys. It might help you, it may not. It it's just another way to organize the information. So you'll see that on the right side, you have the deep cerebellar nuclei, and then you can trace them uh, for your outputs and inputs. Once again, it's just another resource for you guys, uh, whichever works best for you guys to memorize information. But here's just a little more a flow chart to help organize it for you guys if it uh, is useful. Now, blood supply is very important for the cerebellar because, of course, we can have strokes, right? And this is blockage of those arteries, so we must know uh, how the cerebellum gets its blood and where it goes. So the cerebellum has three main sources of blood, and we and they're relatively simple because the name correlates to where they're found. So we have the superior cerebellar artery, which is on, found on the superior portion of the cerebellum. Easy, right? We have anterior inferior cerebellar artery, which is going to be found on the anterior inferior portion of the cerebellum, also known as AICA, uh, is the abbreviation. And next we have posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which you can probably guess is on the posterior inferior portion of the cerebellum, also known as PICA. Now, you have to know which lobes that uh, these arteries supply. So the superior cerebellar artery, SCA, supplies the anterior lobe. The AICA, or anterior inferior cerebellar artery, supplies the flocculonodular lobe. And lastly, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, or PICA, supplies the posterior lobe. So they more or less go uh, hand in hand. Just be careful not to confuse the superior cerebellar with the anterior inferior because superior cerebellar supplies anterior lobe, but anterior inferior supplies flocculonodular lobes, so make sure to keep that straight, don't confuse them. But other than that, it's pretty straightforward. So, now that we know the blood supply, we need to know what happens if it gets damaged, if there's a stroke or any other damage to those particular lobes, we need to know what are the symptoms and how to identify it. So first off, if the flocculonodular lobe is damaged, aka if there's damage to uh, AICA, so the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, if there's damage, 
that will affect your balance because remember flocculo nodular lobe is responsible for balance and head movements so that's going to be impaired like this person will have difficulty walking because they'll have ataxic gait a wide base stance poor body movement coordination because of uh, they cannot tell where their head is in space it feels like their head is floating or wobbling and they can't seem to coordinate their movements so these patients are not going to be able to walk correctly and they're just kind of just going to wobble around because of this because that's why this a lobe is so important now the way you diagnose this uh, I provided a little figure on the bottom right to make a little more sense you're gonna have the patient lay down on the examination table and have their legs up in the air and tell them to walk midair so they're basically gonna cycle their legs as if they were walking in the air now if this person truly has flocculo nodular lobe damage they will be able to walk normally when doing this test now pay attention so when they're walking upright they can they have an ataxic gait cannot balance have uncoordinated movement but when they lay down and their head is stabilized on the table they will be able to walk normally because their sense of balance is coming from their head in this case the head balance is disturbed so if you can stabilize it the rest of the body can function normally so that is that is the way to diagnose this now I remember when I took this class a uh, question among one of the students was what about a C collar doesn't that stabilize the head and the answer here is no because in relation to gravity your head is still gonna feel like it's moving the C collar doesn't stabilize it in that sense I hope that makes sense but so when they're laying down, they're not moving their head and can focus on their core balance instead that kicks in. So once again, flocculo nodular lobe damage is damage to your head balance and sense of space. So you have ataxic gait, wide base stance, and this is how you test it. Now, the reason I emphasize that so much is because the next one is anterior lobe syndrome now this has relatively the exact same symptoms so remember anterior lobe is consistent most of the vermis and intermediate regions so you're going to have issues with core balance because where the vermis is remember how i said flocculonodular patients they have issues with head balance so if they stabilize their head on the table they can walk normally but in this case that will not happen because once again the core balance is affected so the symptoms of course like I said they're gonna be poorly coordinated not be able to walk properly they uh, can't balance that well staggering gait again ataxic gait uh, however if you do the same test where you have the patient lay down on the examination table and put their legs up in the air and pedal their legs as if they were walking midair, their ataxic gait that was present when upright will be present in this test as well. So their legs will not pedal normally. They will just wobble around. And even while laying down, this patient will not be able to exhibit normal uh, walking pattern. It will still be abnormal no matter if they're standing or laying down. So that's one way to differentiate between uh, these two uh, cerebellar damages. Uh, next, we have one more is damage to the posterior lobe or uh, pica. And oh, and before with the anterior lobe, that would be damage to the uh, superior cerebellar artery as well, because once again, that's what supplies it. Here for posterior lobe, if there's damage to pica, then uh, you're going to exhibit these symptoms. Now remember that the posterior lobe, which is essentially the lateral portion, that's uh, more with uh, motor coordination, limb coordination. So you're going to have limb ataxia and delayed limb movement initiation here. So you're going to have a lot of discoordination, poor initiation of movement. Uh, and then there are a few ways to uh, test this. Uh, 
So in addition to having lack of coordination with rapid movements, you can also have uh, dysmetria. Now dysmetria is problems with estimating distance. So the way you're going to test is as seen in the bottom left, you're going to have the patient move their hand, uh, pointing their finger as far away from the face, have them close their eyes and tell them to touch their nose. Now, a normal person can do this no easily because they have that uh, sense of space, uh, but these patients will not be able to do that. They're either going to overshoot or undershoot. So essentially, a person with dysmetria and with posterior lobe syndrome will not be able to touch their nose. Their finger will pass their nose or barely make it to their nose or circle their face. Regardless, it will be extremely difficult for these patients to do this relatively simple task because of this damage. Now you see here we also have dysdiatoconesia. This is difficulty in rapid alternating movements. Now the way you're going to test this is have, as you see in the bottom right, you're going to have the patient rotate their hand back and forth, back and forth, and then speed up. And you're, normally a person can do this very quickly, very rhythmically, absolutely normal, no issue. However, a person with posterior lobe syndrome will have very jerky movements, very slow movements, and will not be very coordinated. They cannot go back and forth that easily or do it uh, correctly at all. It will just be very jerky and uncoordinated. So this is another test. And lastly, we have tremor. Now. Uh, pay attention that this is tremor during fine corrective movements. So therefore, it's a it's uh, a terminal tremor. This means that at rest, they are fine. There's no shaking. But once they make movements, like if they were to point to something, their finger would start shaking when they're pointing at it. But at rest, they're fine. Now, don't confuse this with resting tremor. Resting tremor is present in Parkinson's disease. Uh, which means that even at rest, they are still shaking. They're shaking no matter what. So make sure to differentiate resting tremor from terminal tremor. If it's cerebellar damage, as in this case, it's a terminal tremor. If it's a resting tremor, that's, that means that there's a problem with the basal ganglia. So that's another diagnosis that based on the type of tremor, you can tell where the damage has taken place. Now, uh, in addition, uh, a way to relate this information, everyone knows that when, uh, you know, cops pull you over for drinking, you know, just as a scenario, they ask you to step out of the car, walk in a straight line, possibly touch your finger to your nose, and look at your gait, balance, etc. And what they're looking at, they're essentially doing neurological tests on you because the cerebellum is the first part of your brain to be affected by alcohol. And this is because it's highly vascularized and the circuitry is not uh, that complex either. It's relatively simple. So the alcohol hits it first and fast. So the way that the reason they do those tests on individuals who have been drinking is to test, again, their motor coordination because their cell barrel, if they have been drinking, their cell barrel would absolutely be affected. So that's basically all you guys need to I provided this outline slash review uh, slide for you guys. I just re uh, listed, again, the most important uh, features of this lecture so you guys can use this to study. Make sure that you know each one of these in depth. I can explain it. And if you have any questions, I'll be available for your Q&A next week, I believe. So I look forward to hearing your questions and seeing you then. Thank you, everyone.